This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Tonight's guest, I would have to say, um, is somewhat under par. <laughs> not, uh, not in terms of the uh, stature of our guests, but I think lifetime on the golf course, probably. Uh, Sandy Tatum graduated from uh, the Stanford Law School in 1950 but not until after he had won the uh, NC2A uh, men's individual uh, golf title uh, and a Rhodes Scholarship, uh, which enabled him to do uh, some alleged studying of law uh, at uh, the University of Oxford, although uh, I believe there was a fair amount of golf and skiing involved uh, in that as well. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was the second associate hired by the Cooley Godward firm uh, in, 19, in the fall of 1950 and became eventually a named partner uh, with a distinguished career, first as a litigator for his first five years and then later as uh, a transactional lawyer. Um, now, we only have an hour, so uh, I can't possibly tell you everything that uh, this man is known for. Um, but I will say that he's known, I think, in particular for three things. Uh, he was the president of the United States Golf Association between 1978 and 1980. And he was in charge of the uh, setup of the 1974 U.S. Open at the Wingfoot Golf Club in New York, uh, sometimes referred to as the massacre at Wingfoot. <laughs> uh, number two, he engineered the multi-million dollar renovation of the uh, Harding Park Golf Course here in San Francisco, which is uh, now uh, one of the uh, gems uh, of public golf in the United States, I would say, up there with Beth Page Black and That's York, my view, and I can assure you. Say, Tory Pines. <laughs> he, and you can see he doesn't lack for confidence. Uh, maybe most importantly, he was uh, one of the prime movers in a program called the First Tee, and especially the First Tee of San Francisco, um, which brings golf and its values to uh, children from underserved communities. Um, a few years ago, when uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, which had, uh, I guess, donated a lot of money to the first tee, wanted to do a series of television commercials, um, the uh, casting agency approached Sandy Tatum to be the star of those commercials. And so much of this interview is going to be structured around those commercials because each one of those commercials conveys a value that not only enables children to learn to play golf and to play golf successfully, but it's a value that the first T says will enable them to succeed in life. So if we could hit the lights and run the first commercial, please. I can tell a lot about you playing golf. You get embarrassed by your mistakes. 
And instead of thinking about your next shot, what you're thinking about is what you might do wrong. So forget about your last shot. There's nothing more important than focusing on the shot that's right there in front of you. So let's start from the beginning. The first line that you say is, I can tell a lot about you playing golf. And there's an old cliche, which you refer to in, uh, in your book, A Love Affair with the Game, that um, you can tell a lot about a person by playing a round of golf with them. What, 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 what do you look for when you play a round of golf with somebody? Well, it certainly is a uh, factor. Uh, that there isn't any experience of any kind that I've ever had where I could learn more about a person in 18 holes of golf than I could in any other way. Why? Because the game has a set of characteristics that include very serious challenges. Uh, and all of us have egos of one way or another. Uh, and it, it really very seriously challenges the egos. Uh, that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other, uh, another aspect of it is that uh, the game has a combination of characteristics that include uh, how you approach the playing of it, how you, how you organize yourself, how you think, uh, and how you react. Uh, and uh, all of those characteristics are really very, very important, way beyond, obviously, the game of golf. You talk about embarrassment about mistakes, and of course we're all, I mean, if there's somebody there to see it, uh, we're all embarrassed by our mistakes. And uh, you counsel this young man um, not to worry about what he might do wrong but instead to focus on what's in front of him. Now, there have been some famous meltdowns in the history of major tournament golf. Uh, I'm sure Greg Norman would like to forget uh, <laughs> one of the, one of, uh, more than one of uh, the major tournaments that he's played. Um, how do you do that, though? How, how do you learn from your mistakes if you don't think about them? I mean, how do you learn about your mistakes if you don't dwell on them to some degree? Well, you certainly you learn. If you've got uh, the right set of factors in, in, in you, you learn a lot from your mistakes. But the point of the, the commercial, and the thought I'd like to make is that you, you, so you made some mistakes. Uh, what you've got to do is to concentrate and focus on what you can do now. Uh, and uh, I'm reminded of a, uh, of a Peanuts cartoon uh, where uh, Snoopy is playing and Charlie Brown is caddying for him. And Snoopy's over the ball. And Charlie Brown says to Snoopy, what do you think about just before you play the shot? And he said, I think that I haven't hit a decent shot all day. What makes me think I'm going to hit one now? <laughs> and that, I a think. A formula for success? That's, a, <laughs> that's the, not the formula for success. <laughs> uh, is that true in the practice of law as well? It certainly is. It certainly is. You ever have a, nev a negative experience, whether it was in litigation or in transactional law, where either you made a mistake or something went sideways on you, maybe it was your fault, maybe it wasn't your fault, maybe you feel like there was something more you could have done, um, and, let, and, and then have to let go of it? Absolutely. You know, law, you know, law practice is a, is a very engaging, obviously, and a very serious challenge. Uh, and you're, you're engaged in dealing in situations and with people and circumstances uh, where you inevitably, it seems to me, at least in my own career, inevitably you're going to make a mistake. Uh, and if you, get, if you get yourself in the frame of mind where that mistake begins to be so important 
that you can't get yourself out of it, you're in real trouble. So the key is not to just forget your mistakes without reflecting on them. You need to learn from them. No question about that. But at some point, you've got to turn the page. At some point, you've got to say to yourself, I have gotten out of this what I've got, I'm, what I'm gonna get out of it. It's no longer of use to me, it's gone. Absolutely, and the golf, the golf example, and Snoopy is an example, he had it all wrong. Uh, obviously. Except for the fact that he had his owner caddying for him. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. The point is that you've got, you've got to start focusing on where you're going to go and how you're going to get there. And you can't let the mistakes drive you down. Can we run the next commercial? Frustration. Pride. Happiness. Friendship. That's golf. All golf. It's not that easy, you know. No, no it isn't. Not at all. But if you can't handle golf, how are you going to handle life? By the way, I, I, I very much like the fact that you put that little Irish lilt at the end of the... Uh, how are you going to handle life? <laughs> I thought you were going to say laddie at the end of that. Um, Without naming any names, were there lawyers uh, that you played golf with who handled the game badly? I don't mean they were bad golfers, but they handled adversity badly, or they had bad course management. and you could see the same things in their legal practice. Yes, uh, uh, happily, only a few, uh, but the fact is it's only another example of the fact that what you see on the golf course is what you're gonna see in life. What are the most common mistakes? I mean, I mean the, the most common mistakes that you would say carry over from not handling golf well to not handling, whether it's the practice of law or any profession, not handling that well? Well, there's the, there's the premise about how you approach what it is that you're being obliged to do. And if you approach what you're being obliged to do in a frame of mind that is so confused by the experiences that you've had, like a lousy golf shot, you're not going to hit a very good one. And it works. It really does translate into life in a very, very important way. How about attitude? Um, in, in this book, um, it, it's made very clear that for the, well, I don't know how many thousands of rounds of golf you've played in your life, but it, it comes through very clearly in the book that you view every round of golf as, an, as a privilege, as, a, as an opportunity. And it's easy to go out on the golf course and hit a bunch of bad shots and feel like, oh boy, I just gotta, I just gotta get through this and get back to the 19th hole and drown my sorrows. Um, you see that in the practice of law at all? that things, things uh, somebody doesn't handle adversity well, whether it's in the courtroom, whether it's in a boardroom, and you can tell from that point on, they just see it as a burden. They don't see it as an opportunity anymore to do well. They just see it as playing out the string. Well, it certainly is a, a life lesson, and I've seen enough of it to be uh, distressed by how it affects people, uh, so that they cease to uh, look ahead and uh, I get imbued in looking behind, uh, and they get a personality factor get involved uh, where they are concerned about the way in which they look in the context of the mistakes they make. Uh, and it all adds up uh, to very seriously limiting their effectiveness. And it starts early, doesn't it? It starts long before they become lawyers. 
Oh, absolutely. But the law profession has, in its, has its own challenges, doesn't it? And those challenges are all related to the challenges that you see here. Let me ask you a, a hypothetical, uh, which you can, of course, refuse to answer, uh, but uh, if you could observe somebody's law practice for, uh, let's say, if they're, if they're a transactional lawyer, two or three transactions, or if they're a litigator, watch them try two or three cases, could you more or less tell me what kind of a golfer they were? Not, not, not whether they were good or bad, whether they had talent or didn't have talent, but how they would behave on a golf course, how they would approach the game of golf. You're challenging me in the context where you reverse the operation. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I just want you to know I understand that. <laughs> the, uh, pretty, pretty tough to pull things uh, the, it, it over on a Rhodes well, Scholar. I, I think the most effective example or answer I can somehow manage to make is that there isn't any doubt about it that the characteristics that you see on the golf course translate into characteristics that you see in the law practice. Uh, and if they can't, as I say in that commercial, if you can't handle golf, how are you going to handle life? Let me put it this way. If you can't handle golf, how are you going to handle being an effective lawyer? If you can't handle the frustrations of golf, the need, the needs of organization and structure, the ability the judgment, the self-discipline, is that what you're talking about? So I can't say it any better than that. Can we run the next commercial? I hate this game, I hate it! Doesn't look like golf is liking you very much either, kiddo. I hate golf. <sighs> Gently. Rocking a baby. One of the things that golf teaches you, my young friend, is that hate doesn't work. Hate doesn't work. We ought to send you to the Middle East. <laughs> That's not the only place where I might be useful. <laughs> um. You were a litigator for five years. Uh, it's been my experience, and I'm, my, my wife litigated for, for years, and um, I can tell you that uh, when she came home at night, that uh, I was not to be an academic. I was not supposed to sit there and say, well, you can see the other person's side, can't you? I mean, the argument is blah, 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 blah. Uh, it was, uh, you know, that got, that got a pretty fierce look, like whose side are you on? Um, and I could, I could see some hate there. Now, maybe not deep-seated hate, as in, you know, this is an evil person, but doesn't hate, in some sense, motivate litigators to litigate harder? Wouldn't occur to me to be a uh, positive factor uh, in uh, any setting uh, in litigation or otherwise that I can think of. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, in my experience, uh, both personally and in terms of, of where I've been around in life, uh, it is a uh, it's it's a distraction, and it, it it interferes with your effective ability to look ahead and focus and perform. So the motivation has to come from somewhere else. It has to come from sure a, maybe maybe a competitiveness, which is not the same thing as hate. No, nope. you want to win. Hardly. <laughs> you want to win, but. Um, I have to say that that last commercial uh, actually uh, 
actually helped my golf game when I when I, I saw it. Uh, because I, now, not enough, I should add, but um, you said, uh, you're talking about hate and you're saying that the message of the commercial is that hate doesn't work. And your technical advice to the girl is gently, like rocking a baby. And you can't rock a baby gently if you're filled with hate. No way. Um, is that part of the secret of golf? Is, and I'm, go I'm gonna run out of words here, but is it a certain uh, uh, serenity almost? A certain serenity that allows you to perform, to allow your body to do what it knows how to do naturally? Without any question, and the way I would put it is this way. Uh, golf requires focus. Uh, and the, the degree by which you can the degree to bring to bear the focus is on the shot that you have to play, uh, to that extent that you bring it to bear, to that extent you've got a better chance to succeed. And I would uh, put it on a broader basis. The difference between a good golfer on the tour, for example, okay. uh, and a great golfer is the ability to focus. The ability to take out of all of the distractions that are available to you such as being in a frame of mind if you hate something, to take out of the way all of those distractions and focus on what you have to do with that particular shot in that, those particular circumstances. And the most recent example that I can give you, which really tells it all, is Tiger Woods. You can, I, you can see it. I literally can see it uh, in Tiger. And I, I also, you know, had a marvelous part of my life that is still going on in terms of the relationship with Tom Watson. And I played a lot of golf with him in all kinds of circumstances. Uh, and it, I soon learned uh, that while between shots, Watson was absolutely with you and you could talk about anything. But once he started to look at that golf shot, everything else left it totally, and you could just sense the focus to the effect that I told him one day, I said, Watson, I think we're wasting you. I think we can use you as a cancer cure because you get over the ball and you positively are radiating. Uh, and it does, it, does, it does impress me that way. Uh, so that, without any question, it's crucial. And in the practice of law, the same kind of focus. You do, uh, for certain things, you have to have a broad perspective. Oh, no doubt you've about got, that. You've got to be, if you're a litigator, you've got to be looking at the whole case. You've got to be looking at it. But then when you're focused on a task, that kind of laser-like focus is essential. It's an exact analogy. Not any question. What about in transactional law? Transaction? Did you say? Yeah, in transactional law, if you're in the if you're in the middle of a deal, is is it the same? Is it the same thing? You have to look at it as an organic whole, but then a particular clause or a particular. Uh, I'm not a transactional lawyer, so I'm not very good at these analogies. But you know, a particular clause or a particular uh, you know uh, provision that you're going to have to focus in on it with that same kind of intensity? No doubt about it. You know, in transactional law, there are a lot of distractions and a lot of elements, all many times working at the same time. And you've got to be able to segregate them uh, and be sure that you are very carefully focusing on where you want to go and how you're going to get there in the particular situation. What was the... Can you remember the deal that you did that provided the most distractions? I mean, what, of all the deals you ever did. There were a lot of distractions. Wow. The one where, the one where there, it was just a three-ring circus, 
and and you were and you felt like and you and you felt like you were just juggling. You know, uh, it, uh, it it may have been in the context of having uh, managed the uh, what I think maybe was the first IPO in Silicon Valley for Raychem. Uh, and, uh, the initial public offering for Raychem. Yes, uh, and I uh, I had never done one, uh, and uh, it was important to put it mildly. Uh, and the, uh, the the process was full of all kinds of distractions uh, that were forever coming up, and the, and involved in it clearly was the timing factor, uh, and the let me put it this way. The pressure was on, uh, and the ability to deal with it. So you had, pre you, had the, you had pressure from the client. You had pressure from within the firm. You had the, pressure from the deadlines that were set uh, by the SEC. Those, and the, the pressure of wanting to be able to perform effectively in, in, in a very important and difficult, for me at least, in the circumstances, very difficult project. You bet. And do you think that your experience in golf, and again, you'd had more than a little success uh, as an amateur golfer. You'd won the individual NCAA Men's Championship. I also neglected to mention that you won, uh, I may get the year wrong here, but I think the 1948 Danish Amateur, is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you'd had more than a little success in golf because of your ability to focus? Was, I mean, was that a big part of it? Oh, there's no question about it. I never could focus as effectively as I could hope to focus, but I had the understanding uh, that uh, how the focus affected how I played. I gave it what I had. I think there's, a, there's some element here of ability. You know, the, diff the, the ability to focus Intense, intensely varies without yeah. individually. Yeah, some of it's genetic, some of it's environmental. You just can't say, boy, I'm in the focus. Yeah. Uh, you get what you get, but you've got to be centered on it, centered on it. Uh, and uh, without any question, it had a very substantial impact on whatever I was able to achieve as a golfer. Could you please run the next commercial? Can I move it a little? Well, I don't see any referees out here. Do you? What do you think? Probably not. Bobby Jones would be proud of you. Who's Bobby Jones? Oh, just a guy. You remind me of. Did they make you join the Screen Actors Guild to <laughs> yes. do this? Yeah. You, you actually have to, had to join the... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I'm <laughs> Bobby Jones. Your father once pulled you out of school to go see Bobby Jones play. Now, the young girl in that commercial obviously did not know who Bobby Jones was. Now, the advertising agency knew that these commercials were gonna be running during golf tournaments where the audience was gonna know Bobby Jones. But in that commercial, you are clearly not talking just about Bobby Jones generally. You're alluding to a certain incident. Can you describe that incident? Yes, uh, I, I would like to make a, a, a preliminary comment, uh, and that is that he had a huge influence on my life. Uh, I only met him once. I only saw him play once. Uh, but I was growing up, and I'll give you one quick illustration. He lost the 1926 Amateur Championship to George Von Elm, and it really, I was six years old, and it really seriously upset me. He, you were six? I was six. He, he I was, he, by that time in my life, he was there for me. Uh, and I, I, he, I was motivated to do whatever I possibly could to be like Bobby Jones. 
Uh, and one of the basic factors involved in that was the element of integrity. You know, the, uh, the story about him that took uh, a lot of uh, interest, understandably, uh, was uh, in a game, he, he hit a tee, tee shot into the woods. Uh, and he went into the woods with his caddy, and the, nobody else was there. Uh, and he came out of the woods, uh, and he said, I don't lie two, I lie three because I moved the ball in there when I was addressing it. And somebody said to him later, how remarkable is that? And he said, you know, I don't know. You might as well, you might as well, in, in, uh, you might as well, I'm sorry. You might as well give a medal to no, somebody who know, doesn't rob a I'll bank or something I'll like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you might as well congratulate me for not robbing a bank. Right, right, yeah. right, right, right. So that's uh, so that's the anecdote that you're yeah. alluding to when, um, when she says, when you ask her, well, there's uh, you, you say there's no referees out here, and she says, eh, well, probably not. Um, now, this is uh, this is a dog eat dog world, um, and not just the business world, but the legal profession as well. And it's getting more and more so that way every, every day. Um, people in the professional world today don't often call penalties on themselves, uh, whatever that would look like. Um, and especially for, for kids. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry to refer to my uh, students as kids. I, that's condescending, but a young, uh, adults who are just beginning their careers, their externs for judges, their summer associates, um, they are not, shall we say, uh, secure in their uh, careers or their employment. They're not in a position where they can easily say, oh yeah, I, I dropped the ball on that one and, you know, what are you going to do? You know, I'm a named partner in the firm. Uh, Would your advice really be to them, call a penalty on yourself? Um, is, is, isn't that sort of a license for unemployment? It doesn't occur to me that way. Uh, what, the way it occurs to me is that you're not calling a penalty on yourself. You're playing according to the rules. That's the name of the game. The name of the game in golf, in my view, it's the name of the game in life. So if you really blew one, if you were writing a memo for a partner and you missed a key case and you got your partner smoked in the courtroom, you fess up to that. Happily, I never had that experience, so I don't know how I would handle it. <laughs> <laughs> But presumably the answer would be yes. <laughs> Can we uh, run the last commercial? Who's your ball? No, it's right here. I'm just thinking about my next shot. Thinking? Yeah, just thinking. Always a good idea, my young friend. Well, it doesn't take uh, too much imagination to, uh, to figure out what the message in that commercial is. But let me play devil's advocate for a moment. <clears throat> the public's imagination, even in golf, is captured by people of action. John Daly, grip it and rip it. Arnold Palmer, before him, who it seemed like would never play a safe shot when he could play a risky one. 
and they were loved for it. That that's what that's what made them that's what made them popular. How do you know when it's time to stop thinking and it's time to take action? Well, it's difficult to handle that in the abstract, but I think uh, the commercial clearly uh, makes the point that uh, before, you, before you move forward, think. And think it through. Be very, very thoughtful about where you're going, how you're going to get there. That's the message. And I think it's dead right. Uh, it certainly applies to playing a golf shot, but obviously it certainly applies in life. What about for a young associate at a firm? Now, I had that experience once upon a time, and uh, the partner would hand you a file, and the partner was always late for something, uh, and so would hand you the file and not tell you anything about the case and just say, well, just do this. And you'd sort of sit there, I'd sit there, and I'd try and go through the file. I couldn't make head, head or tails of it. And I'd eventually go to somebody who was, had a little more experience, and I'd ask for an exemplar. And then I'd have to, and then I'd realize this isn't the same, exact same situation. So, so what do I do? Do I sit here and I think about it and I think about it and I think about it and I try and reinvent the wheel, or do I just, I just fill in the blanks? You're saying. Think about it, but at some point, that that brief's got to get written, or that memo's got to get done, or that contract's got to get drafted. At some point, that young boy sitting on that bench going to play the shot. He's there's going to be people behind him saying, "Come on, while we're young," as Rod, as Rodney Dangerfield said in in Caddyshack. <laughs> Um, when do you personally feel like you're done analyzing a shot in golf? Well, I mean, well, can, can you describe the, the sense that it, it, there's, it, there must be some kind of a feeling that you get, like, okay, that's enough, I'm ready. It happens on virtually every golf shot. Uh, because you are trying to achieve something that has very clear definitions, uh, and you've uh, you've got to think it through. Uh, and at some point, you've got to play the shot. Uh, and in, in, in the practical circumstances, I think, are likely to limit how long you can think about it. Because at some point, you've got to make up your mind it's and go. Got to get done. And I don't know how you can draw that line. In the abstract, you can't it's got to happen in the in individual situation. But the point of the commercial is that uh, don't get into something uh, without thinking about it. And that's part of the judgment, right? That that's that's part of the judgment yes. that that uh, that the that the first T is is trying to teach. So let me read uh, the. the uh, the, the nine core values of the first T, and then just very, very briefly, I want to have you comment, because so I, I don't think it's obvious, again, in the abstract, I've been asking you a lot of things in the abstract, um, and, uh, and, and so I want to put a little meat on the bones of some of these things. Um, the nine core values of the first T are listed as follows. Number one, honesty. Number two, integrity. Number three, sportsmanship. Number four, respect. Five, confidence. Six, responsibility. Seven, perseverance. Eight, courtesy. And number nine, judgment. So, In your opinion, I, I know I'm not looking for the official position of the first T here. I'm, a, I'm asking you personally. For you, what's the difference between honesty and integrity? A lot of people think it's the same thing. 
I, I think that's a difficult decision uh, that the line to draw. But uh, clearly, uh, you, you're you're being you're being honest uh, with yourself, for example, uh, and uh, the uh, that 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 is something different from having integrity. That's one distinction. Not being in self denial. No. That's so that that's a function of honesty yeah. as opposed to integrity. Yeah. Okay. Um, what does integrity mean to you? That's difficult to answer in the abstract, I have to say, but I'm not uh, complaining about being asked the question. Uh, integrity. Uh, to well, maybe you could give an example of. I, I, of, I'm, of no, no, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> thinking. <laughs> thinking. <laughs> Always a good thing to do. Integrity, to me, means, for example, uh, that you've got a situation where it would be probably to your benefit to go in one direction. And that direction has in it some serious questions about whether it's the right thing to do uh, in terms of the moral or ethical factors uh, involved in it. Uh, and you take the right choice. And that's different from honesty because it, it doesn't involve, it's not a question of whether you're telling right. the truth or not. Yeah. It's a question of whether you're doing the right thing. That's exactly right. I think there's a clear distinction. Sportsmanship, what does that mean to you? Being able to play a game, for example, uh, in the context where you conduct yourself in such a way as to being a positive factor with regard to the other people that are in the game uh, rather than a negative one. Uh, and uh, you, you, you also, that's one aspect of it, surely. Uh, another aspect of it is uh, that you, you, you don't so conduct yourself as to have a negative influence on the people that are affected by your conduct uh, in the context of playing a competitive game. Um, in the context of litigation, is that important? <laughs> I, I chuckle at myself a little bit because uh, litigation so often involves gamesmanship and uh, all, all, all the rest of it. Uh, but I, uh, I don't really translate the sportsmanship aspect into the litigation area uh, easily. I, I don't see quite how it fits the environment. But I do think that you should be concerned about conducting yourself so that you're a positive factor. Uh, may, uh, maybe if, uh, if, if they're repeat players, if you've got, you know, a, a prosecutor that's always coming up against a certain public defender, you've got a, a continuing relationship, maybe sportsmanship does become more important. But if it's a one-shot deal, it's hard to see. Um, respect? What is that? Um, it, the, the first T defines it as to feel or show deferential regard for or esteem. Uh, now, I'm not asking you to disagree with the official definition from the first team, but what does it mean to you personally? Uh, respect has a lot of factors in it, doesn't it? But the, to me, the thing that comes through uh, is that you respect somebody else's thoughts or actions uh, in a uh, context where uh, you can make a positive uh, effect on that person. And it also uh, comes to uh, uh, play, I think most often, uh, when you are in the situation where you are in contact with uh, somebody who has done something that has been a positive factor, particularly in your life, uh, you respect them. 
confidence. Uh, now here I have, this is, this is my biggest problem, is they always say, trust your swing. You gotta trust your swing. So I go out and I hit six bad shots in a row. Now a rational person would say, the next shot is not likely to be very good. So why should I have confidence in, it's not rational, why should I have confidence in that, in that next shot? I have to note that that goes right back to the Snoopy cartoon, doesn't it? Okay? <laughs> that's a fair question. <laughs> but the, question, the answer is that maybe you shouldn't have, but don't kid, maybe, you, maybe what you should do is kid yourself. But for heaven's sake, don't get locked up on the shot that you're going to play by the lousy shots that you played. Because if you do, you're going to carry on hitting lousy shots, and that certainly applies to life. Well, you've talked about that. Yeah, before the interview started, you were, you were talking about the challenges of playing, of relearning how to play the game as your body changes and as we all in, you know, inevitably get older and, and, our, and our skills our skill level changes. And so how are you dealing with that now in, in terms of the confidence aspect? Because you know that your body's not the same as it was certainly in 1942 when you were holding that trophy in your hand. Um, or even, I think you told me uh, at the age of 85, isn't that what you said, that you shot a 73? Which I, I, I can't even, think about that. I couldn't even think of shooting an 85 when I was 73, but um, in any event. Um, how, how are you dealing with, with that confidence factor now? As related I, to that question, uh, I wrote a piece that Golf Digest published some years ago, and I called it Unrequited Love. Uh, and my thesis was <laughs> that I had had this love affair virtually all my life. Uh, that had been satisfactory, besides satisfying, beyond words. And uh, all of a sudden, the game left me for a younger player. Uh, <laughs> and when it did, when it did, I, I, uh, I had to deal with the fact that uh, my former lover had a cruel streak, because it would turn up on the practice tee and uh, incite me into thinking that maybe we were going to have a reunion of this love affair. And then on the way to the first tee, it would abandon me for yet another 18 holes of unrequited love. And the way in which I've dealt with it is to say to myself and say and act accordingly that I've still got something left. And uh, I can't be wasting what I've got left in life, in particularly in golf life, worrying about what I no longer have. What I have to do is to find out what I still have left and make that work as well as I possibly can. And I find the challenge, two things. I find the challenge really stimulating. And, and the other is that I'm so grateful to be out there swinging at it at age 91 that I could break out in tears. <laughs> Responsibility. Players are responsible for their actions on the golf course. And lawyers are responsible for their actions as professionals. Um, <clears throat> it may be a little more serious where law is concerned. Um, Is responsibility something that can be developed later in life, or does it have to start with, with kids? I, I, it strikes me as being a rather natural progression of your experience 
that you have to take responsibility for your actions and for what you think, how you think, and how you act, and how you live. Uh, it's up to you. How about perseverance? Uh, this says to persist in an idea, purpose, or task despite obstacles. Now, somebody, uh, somebody famous, I should know it, but uh, somebody, I think it was Einstein, was it Einstein who said that, that in the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and, and expecting different results? That's not what you mean by perseverance, is it? Oh. Uh, that's my golf game, <laughs> but that's not what you mean by perseverance. <laughs> perseverance, uh, for me, uh, involves a situation where uh, you've got some serious difficulties trying to do what it is you hope to be able to do, uh, and you can't overcome those difficulties without persevering. There is a lem there's a limit, obviously, but perseverance is a crucial aspect uh, in dealing with the problems that we all have. Now, the next one is courtesy, and again, I'm going to ask you, uh, there, you uh, we already talked about respect. Uh, courtesy flows from respect, or courtesy is independent of respect, or how would you say, how would you put it? Uh, I think of courtesy as, as, a, as a, an example of opening the door so somebody can go through who's got difficulty managing it from one end to the one place to the other. You're being courteous. Uh, you're also being courteous when you deal with somebody uh, who may be having some problems uh, and you have you deal with that person. Uh, in a sensitive way that uh, doesn't aggravate the situation for that person. And finally, judgment. Uh, that is a hard one because that's what we evaluate law students on, ultimately, no question. is their judgment. <clears throat> and uh, some of them do great on their exams and some of them even though they're really, really smart people, don't do as well. And I have to explain to them, well, I, it, was, it was my evaluation that your judgment in applying the law to the facts in this situation was off. How would you define judgment? And can judgment be taught, or is it just something that comes from experience, or is it just inborn? Well, uh, certainly not inborn. Uh, and I do think it's a, it's a product of experience. Uh, and it has uh, the element that it, it, you've got decisions to make. Uh, and you learn uh, by experience uh, whether or not you made the right decision because you are a witness to the result. Uh, and you are, therefore, in a position where you're developing judgment. We only have a few minutes left, and um, I have to ask you, because you are such a, a major figure in public golf in San Francisco, what do you think is the future of public golf here? Harding now, because of your efforts, is a world-class golf course. Lincoln Park, which you write about in the book, in the saddest kind of terms, is, has deteriorated and it's deteriorated very substantially. It was where I played my first round of golf, but it's almost unplayable at this point. Sharp Park is in the midst of litigation. I understand that 
There are those, uh, that there are people who are suing under the Endangered Species Act um, to, uh, who, who are claiming that the pumping of water and mowing on a couple of the holes uh, are harming uh, the California red-legged frog and the San Francisco garter snake, which is an endangered species. Um, what do you say to those folks? Well, first, I put it as briefly as I can manage to do. Uh, golf is an absolute priceless recreational resource. Playing golf in the right frame of mind is, is a, a life extender and a life enhancer. I can summarize with that phrase, and it goes a lot deeper than that. Uh, and in respect of Sharp Park, uh, it's an absolutely um, horrendous example, in my judgment, of how the environmentalists can get out of control. Uh, and because you've got, in the first place, it, before the golf course was there, there were no red lake frogs. Uh, the marshes were They were all, attracted to the court. But they, no, they were all salt, salt marshes. Uh, and the irrigation system eventually turned into fresh water, and the red lake frogs turned up. And then uh, they've been, uh, the, the golf course and the, the golfers and the red lake frogs have been working together uh, effectively for many, many years. And the red lake frog uh, population has been increasing. And what the environmentalists want to do is to destroy that priceless piece of recreational facility to accommodate and creating more red lake frogs. Uh, and so it, it doesn't make even the remotest kind of sense. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, uh, an element in it that is quite remarkable. Uh, garter snakes they, they've thrown into the picture. Nobody has seen a garter snake. The only sight of a garter snake has been in 2006, and nobody and they saw one, and nobody's seen one since. And, and just to put the garter snake... Well, that's because it's in danger. <laughs> but put it in the proper frame of reference. The garter snakes, for God's sake, eat the frogs. <laughs> that's an unbelievable situation, to put it mildly. Well, maybe the question is, do the frogs have standing to sue the snakes? <laughs> they damn well should. <laughs> On that note, Sandy Tatum, thank you for speaking legally. <laughs>